try to combine two talks in, if possible, it may be like a drive-by shooting uh, rather than a regular presentation. But I want to first review uh, the digital atlasing program, which has been going on for about four years now. Uh, Joel Boleyn has been uh, spearheading this at, at the implementation stage and done a superb job, and that's why her name really uh, appears here, numero uno. Um, it was initiated, I think uh, Jan got this up and st started in uh, late 2006, invited me to uh, set up a, a meeting in Stockholm in February of uh, 2007, which was my first introduction to uh, Swedish winter, and it wasn't so bad after all. Uh, terrific group uh, participated. And uh, we produced uh, a document of this type. Those of you who work at these, uh, contribute to the INCF workshops are familiar with these. Uh, this is actually the second uh, document that, that the task force produced. It's extremely comprehensive, 25 pages, and it's in the back, a few extra copies there. So if some of you want to know about the first two reports and, and what we proposed to do, uh, you're welcome to, to get that document. Uh, it, Pilsen things started to uh, get instantiated. In other words, we started to actually uh, produce code and standards and implement them. And here at Kobe in 2010, I'm proud to say that uh, it's, gotten, uh, it's, it's gotten very real. Uh, these are the members who have contributed uh, both to the oversight committee initially, a group of 10 of us of whom five are present in the room or should be present in the room. Uh, and then uh, again, uh, uh, ten, 10 of you on the task forces are, are here present at uh, Kobe. Uh, this is uh, primarily taken from the website. We've had a lot of additions. And this is a good example of how the INCF has been able to leverage uh, a, a very large community effort at relatively modest cost. Uh, so I think that's exactly what the INCF was supposed to do, the C, the coordination, and uh, it's really worked well. And so thank you to, to those of you who are on this list. And uh, if I've neglected anybody, please come and see me or Jill. Happy to add you. Um, so the vision is quite simple. Uh, we need a Rosetta Stone for, for atlasing. We need this for, for multiple species, but we thought initially we'd start with mouse and rat. We've gotten pretty far with mouse, and we're just beginning to, to start with uh, a, a rat, a Rosetta brain, as it were, something that we can translate across different atlases and now web services. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the history of, of this uh, area, it has been log jammed because of uh, the proprietary nature of um, rodent atlases. Uh, Elsevier had a pretty, uh, pretty tight lock on this, uh, and, and thanks to the effort, uh, we now have essentially an open source uh, tool that can be used to mediate across all of these efforts, including Elsevier. Um, so uh, I, th I think we just needed that lingua franca to really make this uh, work well for the community and allow that kind of integration that's been discussed numerous times at this meeting and, and other INCF-sponsored summits. Uh, so let me give you the uh, fourth year status report. report. We really have a uh, major improvement in the uh, ecosystem or ecology of digital atlasing. At this meeting uh, out there in, in front of us, there are 12 plus a baker's dozen worth of abstracts and demonstrations using uh, some resources that have been generated by the INCF digital atlasing efforts. And I'm just going to flash through some of these. This is perhaps the, the most general of the presentations of the entire initiative by Jill and colleagues. Uh, Richard Baldock and colleagues, uh, a particular uh, elegant implementation that, that uh, gets MBAT or, or works with MBAT. I won't name all of these, but just flash them on. Uh, this is just from my iPhone shot out there, and then uh, so that accounts for the lousy quality. But you can see we've uh, got a lot going on. And I think next year, this is really going, this, this current year, it's really going to take off. This is a publication in an Elsevier doc, uh, uh, the irony. This is published in, in Neuroimaging, an Elsevier uh, publication by Al Johnson and colleagues. And this is the uh, first uh, 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 publication on the Wax Home space by uh, one of the deliverables of, of our uh, Atlasing program. It shows uh, a C57 black six brain, so this is the same sort of mouse as has been used by the Allen Brain Atlas. Uh, it's segmented, 
It's a canonical volume, so this is essentially our Rosetta brain, the brain that we're going to use to translate coordinates. So over on the uh, lower right side, you see the translation scheme that has been developed by Ilya and colleagues. Uh, you've already seen this in Sten's talk, so this uh, describes some of the, the uh, architecture that's being built. So this is one of the efforts of the task force, very active task force that Ilya is, is leading. Um, and they are developing uh, both the, the standards, the community buy-in to those standards, and actually implementing uh, the, 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 the infrastructure that's required to implement these. So there's a markup language that um, is used to describe uh, Atlas resources and allow them to, uh, tr to coordinates to be translated across. And that's referred to as the WAX, uh, for WAX home uh, space, WAX ML. Uh, we currently have a few uh, sites that are actually using this space. Uh, for example, the ABA and EMAP in Edinburgh are using this, and we expect to have quite a few more over the next uh, several years. So we really have broken the log, uh, log jam on this kind of uh, communication across atlasing environments, which will make the integration far more feasible. These are some of the instances right now that are already uh, making use of uh, the wax home space and the digital um, infrastructure, digital atlasing infrastructure, with INCF in Stockholm uh, playing a particularly critical role in uh, hosting services. So these are the deliverables. This is mostly for Sten's benefit <laughs> when, when he has to go before the governing board and say, what did you do with our money? And so I won't read through them all. Uh, I just want to take, a, the, obviously the INCF has, has done a you know, great job catalyzing this activity. Uh, the ABA mirror is, is one thing that, that the digital atlasing workforce uh, didn't have much to do with, uh, but we'll take credit for it anyway. Uh, it's a, terrific resource and it's great to have uh, the ABA here, oh, well, there in Europe. So I want to move on to uh, a, a second part of this talk. Uh, we've, so, so part of this, this slide, uh, systems architecture is taken uh, from Stephen's poster outside. Um, and I think what, what I've demonstrated and, you know, and what the uh, digital atlasing uh, program has demonstrated is that we have pretty control, good control over the where and the what, or at least we potentially have good control over wh where an item is and, and what it is. Uh, the what primarily comes from the PONS effort that you'll hear about after me, uh, but where is done. Uh, but that's not really good enough. It's not simply good enough to know where things are and what they are. You want to actually extract some causality for this. And I think after Lee Hood's talk, uh, one, one has to develop uh, high throughput methods to get at causality. And I'm going to show you uh, how we do it in, uh, well, there's another community that I participate in called the Complex Trait Community. And I'll show you how we're using or will be using the Wax Home space to um, create globally coherent data sets and to use those data sets to get causality out at scale. So the causality will come out not one experiment at a time, but one will be able to test a large number of loci. And um, the, the uh, key, key culprits in this process, or, or my collaborators, are those two strains of mice. Uh, C57 black 6, you've already met in the back, and Dilute DBA2J is actually the oldest inbred strain, 101 years worth of inbreeding today. Um, here they are, the male and the female. This is the mom and the dad of a large family of progeny strains. So these two strains differ at about 5 million sequence variants. That's more common sequence variants than in this entire room of humanity, uh, which is an impressive level of, of genetic diversity. Uh, and those two strains of mice were used to produce a hundred other strains. And we have all of these in our lab in Memphis. Uh, you're welcome to come visit and, and uh, study these. But let me show you what we can do with a globally coherent data set generated from these mice. Oh, first let me show you some, some cute mice. So that's strain nine. 22, 27, rampant, 39, curious, 43, expectant, 101, 102, 103. Just some nice photographs. But the idea is to get through and be able to do high throughput neuroanatomy with these brains. And over the last uh, 15 years, I've been collaborating with a group uh, led by Glenn Rosen at Beth Israel Deaconess. And we've put together a mouse brain library. We've been doing this a very long time. Um, and we now have about 4,400 slides from, from that population, other populations of mice, 
Unfortunately, all of these images are unregistered and they are almost unusable to the community. There's no way you can explore 4,400 slides from 2,200 cases and about 200 strains of mice. Microsoft finally came through for me, uh, and uh, Pivot uh, uh, is a terrific application. So if you take anything home from this talk, have a look at uh, Microsoft Live Lab Pivot, uh, one of my, uh, Microsoft's better purchases over the last five years. Uh, I had a lot of help in putting this together. Uh, my co colleagues in, in Memphis, uh, Glenn Rosen, um, Mike Harowitz, and, and Len, Leonard Quown at the ABA, and a lead programmer. So this is, uh, let me give you a little demonstration of what this looks like. This is going live. So the website is mbl.pivotcollections.org. This is now a new type of browser. These are all, this is a set of about a thousand slides. Uh, they're little, both basically postage stamps of each slide, and I'm pivoting the collection. Here I'm looking at sex. I've got males on one side and females on the other. Then I can look at age, and now I've got them in histograms by age. But I want to zoom in on the, the set of uh, slides that are from the zero day to 100 day cases. Here you have a little uh, normal distribution. I want to zoom in on a particular age range. Those are all the cases now that are between 50 and 55 days of age. And I can drill down to one micron per pixel on any one of these uh, images. And I'll show you that in a few minutes. Well, actually, <laughs> based on this, uh, it should be less than that. Um, <laughs> Let's see, so there, I'm going to shorten this a little bit uh, in the interest just of getting you to a particular case. But pivot, for those of you who aren't familiar with that word, it means to turn rapidly. And what pivot allows you to do is take this massive image collection and rotate it and ask questions and get data sets in a very rapid manner. And this just shows you a query against uh, the uh, midbrain tegmentum and looking at uh, the Raffae region and the, uh, the gray, uh, that just showed you the maximum resolution that we have been able to acquire. So that's about one micron per pixel right there. It's good enough for high quality stereology and uh, morphometry. Obviously, it's not what we ultimately dream of. We'd like to drill down and do this at the TEM level. Uh, good luck. But uh, that's where, certainly where we'd like to be. So we have this sort of data now uh, for all of those strains of mice that I told you about. We, we have the data. We have a, a digital atlasing uh, framework for that. We have this panel of 100 strains. So let me show you how we can actually get to causality. So these are data sets from this set of strains. So this is brain volume. You can't even see the error bars there. Uh, but BXD27, one of the strains I showed you, is the smallest brain. Uh, with about 370 milligrams up to about 510 milligrams morphine response. H5N1 influenza mortality data, all for the same strains. Motor activity, retinal ganglion cell number, lateral geniculate neuron number, do the covary? So that, that's the question. And the answer is, and this is, came as a big surprise to us, there's absolutely no covariation between retinal ganglion cell number and principal neurons in the lateral geniculate. This has actually been replicated, or I should say we replicated a primate finding, uh, which I didn't expect to replicate at all. But there is no correlation between those populations. Uh, fortunate negative result that ended up in Neuroscience, Journal of Neuroscience. In the next uh, one minute, let me add the causality to this. So you've seen the correlations that you can produce, but how about uh, getting at causality? And this is a, an example for Sten's benefit. We're going to look at central pattern generators and ATP1A2, a glial um, uh, ATP transporter or transporter of, of uh, sodium potassium. I've picked three traits, just like I showed you a host of traits there. One is the central pattern generator phenotype, one is ATP1A2 expression data, and one is a SNP, a, a single nucleotide polymorphism. And I'm just showing you the correlation between these types of traits. So this is a trait between the message level of ATP1A2 and lick rate, the central pattern generator that John Bowder and, and colleagues um, measured. And the, the rate is quite different. Those green lines on the y-axis show you the rate difference in, in this, uh, this is actually the inner interlick interval in milliseconds. This is a correlation between the genotype and the lick rate. 
And this is, for those of you who are familiar with gene mapping, if you're not, this is what our spikes look like. You have your type of spikes uh, with voltage on the axis. We have our types of spikes and they have probabilities on the y-axis. And th these are astronomically uh, high LOD scores. In other words, we can assert causality. So I can assert very firmly that a sequence variant in the region of chromosome one near ATP1A2 is causing differences in lick rate. And this is what I, I want to offer to your community. If you want to combine across scales, like Sten said in his talk, you can combine anything with anything using this genetic approach. That's how behavior geneticists are able to go from gene to behavior. They skip all that black box in between, but we don't have to skip it anymore because we can do the TEM and reconstruct very fine volumes. We can do the morphology. We can get uh, the behaviors all from a single reference population. So you need to be able to get um, throughput and you need the spatial registration and then you can really weave together and do this at scale. So instead of home weaving, you can do this high throughput factory weaving. Now that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Rob. And to give some supplementary information, I just uh, made a little Google search on wax home space in brackets on my machine here, and uh, that gave 10,400 hits. Wow. And then that's, I tried out a couple good. of other spaces and Atlas things, and they were not nearly to that level. Well, well, Normally, well, we'll old ones. We'll have to check the semantics on wax. So, okay, so <laughs> maybe a glue in India, for all we know. <laughs> okay, that could be. <laughs> so let's see, do we have any comments or questions to Rob Williams? Uh, Rob, just a question about Pivot. It looked like a visualization tool, but then I thought you were explaining that it relates to how you can correlate between measures. So is there a measurement capability in it as well? Uh, no, that's one of the, li the key limitations of Pivot. Right now it's primarily for exploratory analysis. Uh, Ilya and I have been talking with Microsoft about an overlay that will allow analysis. So if you have males versus females, you want to do a t-test. If you have 10 groups, you want to do an ANOVA. Uh, you want to be able to do draw doodle on your, your images and, and re retain those regions of interest. And those sorts of overlays will be possible, but I think it's going to be a year, year or more. They're very, they have their hands full with this uh, new, new interface. So, so it's really visualization? It is currently visualization unless you're a hacker yourself. So you, you, there are kludgy ways to do what I, what I think you want to do and what I want to do. And we're going to implement some of those kludges, but they won't be as elegant as they need to be. Okay, thank you.